you nostalgic, I'll admit it. We graduated four months ago. What can you possibly be nostalgic for? I'm nostalgic for conversations I had yesterday. I've begun reminiscing events before they even occur. I'm reminiscing this right now. I can't go to the bar because I've already looked back in it in my memory, and I didn't have a good time. Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. It's time for another comic book retrospective. We're going in the Wayback Machine to 1986 Marvel Comics Avengers 273 through 277. We've got the Avengers squaring off against the Masters of Evil. Good stuff from Roger Stern. We got John Buscema, Tom Palmer on this comic book. And here with me to discuss this is award winning comic book editor Joe Corral. How are you doing? I'm all right, Wes. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. We've also got the voice of the voiceless, the comic book hoarder himself. The man's so cool, they call him the Breed. Eric Breen, what's going on, buddy? Ready to talk some Under Siege. I know you had to be the most happy about all of this that we picked this. I, the Avengers are your favorite comic book team. Yes. Yeah, it's not even close. When Eric named off his top 10 Marvel stories of all time, four of them were Avengers stories, and this wasn't even one of them, which is actually kind of surprising because this thing is action-packed, got a lot of things going in here. An interesting version of the team here, Breen, but uh, I don't know. this. If this is what the Avengers were in 86, there's plenty of stuff to, to pick the bones on for uh, the MCU moving forward. Yeah, I so said the reason why this wasn't on the list was I the, the whole Stern run was so good I just kind of look at it as like one big long story and you go back and you read something that you may not have gotten to for a while. And I, when I read this, I said, and this, you know, this could have been on that list because I honestly, I'd forgotten just how good it was. Yeah. It's pretty crazy, Joe. Uh, Roger Stern certainly has a, a sparkling record just as far as uh, the quality of work that he put out. But for some reason, when you hear people like debating the greatest comic writers of all time, his name doesn't seem to come up as much as you, it probably warrants. Yeah, it's it's very weird. I mean, there's a lot of people like... Uh, I mean, there aren't a lot of people like Roger Stern, but there are some other writers there like uh, J.M. DeMattis or DiMatteis um, and, and people like them who were doing incredible groundbreaking stuff throughout the 80s that seemed to get like eclipsed by that like British invasion that whenever people the, the British invasion and Frank Miller whenever people were talking about groundbreaking stuff in the 80s you often hear Alan Moore, Grant Morrison, Neil Gaiman, Frank Miller Garth and yeah you, you know it, you getting people like him and uh, coming up after that so and Warren Ellis and all that going into the 90s but these guys are putting out incredible work Roger Stern Jan Gimitas and uh, even Mark Grunwald you know I, I, I love what he was doing on, on Cap at the time so like there Tom DeFalco is putting out uh, really solid work but it all seemed to get eclipsed by all that and it, it's really it's it's weird and it's really too bad because this this stuff's really great. Well, and that is too bad, Joe, because when you look at the British invasion, that was all about deconstructing heroes yeah. for the most part. Mm -hmm. it's almost every story, like initially of Vertigo, is deconstruction of a superhero. Mm -hmm. And it's good. They're, they're all told you know, very well. Saga of the Swamp Thing is one of the best comics I've ever written or read personally. Sure. But unfortunately, it turns out that that's the blueprint and the influence of a lot of uh, the, the next generation of comic writers. Instead of what you're seeing here in Roger Stern, Mark Grunewald, JMD Mateus, where, you know, too many people go the de deconstruction route instead of doing this and really celebrating classic heroes. Absolutely. Well, yeah. Guys like Roger Stern never appealed to the edgier fans. But you'd be hard pressed to find a better superhero comics writer in comic book history than Roger Stern, because his he's like that guy that will hit three hundred every year. Yeah, yeah. So Joe, you touched on it, you know, a little bit there. We're going from November eighty six to March eighty seven when Avengers two seventy three to two seventy seven happened. Obviously, things are changing in the comic book industry. Vertigo. Is, is a big agent of change within comic books and is really still to this day is influencing. You know, you see Vertigo kind of got removed out of DC and it is kind of image comics now, almost to a point. Yeah, it's, um, 
this is just a really interesting time in in general in comics. Uh, this is while this is going on, this story, you've got Peter David on the Hulk, you got Walt Simonson on Thor, you got Tom DeFalco on Spider Man. You have this is like during the transition, like Roger Stern's also doing Fantastic Four because uh, this is like that. This is like after the burn stuff, before we settle into, you know, we get a little bit of, I think, Simonson and then DeFalco taking over Fantastic Four. I, I think that's what's going on there. Englehart also. Englehart, yeah, as well. And then you get, uh, you know, Grunwald's on Cap, but that's a pretty safe bet if you're talking about Captain America between like 1985 and 1994, uh, that, that Grunwald's writing it with very few exceptions scattered out. Uh, so, so you have all that. Jim Shooter, this is the end of his era, basically. He's not on as editor-in-chief for too much longer after this story wraps up. And then over at DC, Christ, the, the events of crisis and, and uh, the post-crisis era is starting. While this story is coming out, the start of Batman Year One is happening. Beautiful. So when people are talking about comics and how today is different, and oh, you know, back then, you know, these things were happening, and how people criticize that, and you can't keep looking back. But and on the one hand, I do get that. On the other hand, you have Under Siege coming out alongside Batman Year One. Burns, Superman, George Perez on <laughs> Wonder Woman, <laughs> Simonson's Thor, Peter D- David's Hulk. <laughs> like you're just like putting all this, and you're like, you know, maybe, maybe they're onto something. It's an embarrassment of riches. <laughs> you, you wish you could be a young Eric Breed and be living all this stuff in the moment. <laughs> it did not suck. Yeah, absolutely not. So this is a uh, fantastic stuff. As I mentioned before. Roger Stern writing, John <coughs> Buscema on inks. I'm sorry, pencils. Tom Tom Palmer is on Tom inks. Palmer. Avengers 273 is the very first issue. This one's called Rights of Conquest. The Avengers are a little bit different uh, team. They're, they're pretty small, at least in the beginning episode. We've got Black Knight, Captain Marvel, Marvel Monica Rambeau, Hercules, and Wasp are essentially the Avengers in here with uh, backup support from Jarvis. And the Masters of Evil are going to reform under the leadership of Baron Helmet Zemo with Goliath, Yellow Jacket, Moonstone, Blackout, Mr. Hyde, Fixer, Absorbing Man, Titania, Tiger Shark, Wrecking Crew with uh, Pile Driver, Record, Thunderball, and Bulldozer. So the numbers are definitely not in favor of the Avengers when this story opens up. And it, it opens up in a pretty funny scene here, Eric. And it really sows some of the seeds that we'll see come to fruition. We've got Hercules at a bar. He's performed feats of strength. He's having drinks, having a good time. He sits down. One of the patrons of the bar decides to bust his chops a little bit, ask him what it's like to work for a dame, you know, basically saying you're working for a woman. Hercules can't take it. He breaks a glass. He throws the guy out the door. Unfortunately, he throws him into oncoming traffic. He has to go in there and, and destroy someone's truck. Hopefully that guy didn't die, but he saves him. And then we find out that they're being observed by the Wrecker and Yellow Jack. And the Wrecker was actually the one that sent him into a rage breed. It was a great opening scene. Yeah, it, and one of the great things about Stern's run was he had a, you know, a Claremontian flair for subplots. And this had been building for a while. Yeah. Hercules had a problem with the Wasp being the team leader. And I don't know if it was so much him being sexist or that he just had that much more respect for Captain America, but he had reached his breaking point by this time as far as like putting up with what he, you know, um, her orders. And so he had taken to carousing even more than usual. And that led to this scene that, because as I said, this was all orchestrated to rile him up because they, they knew that if you, if, if they wanted to strike at the Avengers, they had to take out the strongest piece and this was the best way to do it. 
Yeah. It's great stuff, Joe, because it really it's laying the foundation for all the stuff that's going in here. And as Eric say, saying, it's building on what's already established. But you know, we get the seeds of discontent. How you're going to separate the the team? But you also firmly establish that there's a team that are monitoring them because they're wanting to take them over. Perfect way to intro intro a story. Yeah. No. A- absolutely. And you know, I, I also I, I should have mentioned David Michelini on on Iron Man too. This was all during. Uh, we're, we're almost at uh, Armor Wars or Stark Wars, as it was called, as it was uh, coming out. Uh, this is, uh, what was it? We have a confrontation with the Super Patriot John Walker before Cap No More. Like, the lead-up to Cap No More is happening while this is happening. <laughs> I, I mean, it's all just... Th- there was the, um, the whole Scourge bit is going on right now where you're, you're getting uh, this madman going around killing killing off super villains with uh, justices served and all of that that whole thing that's kind of been memory hold a bit I think because uh, that was interesting and, and was helping tie a lot of the Marvel universe together it's Hey, no, I'm going on a bit of a tangent here. It's just there's so much happening right now. <laughs> you need to go back on the Wayback Machine with us. <laughs> Hit that 1986, 1987 time frame and see what what it could be like because this, this stuff's crazy. And we yeah. get to Baron Zemo, uh, Joe, and he's managing, you know, he's the he's managing the new Masters of Evil. At the same time, we do see Monica Rambeau, Captain Marvel, is kind of monitoring the solar system. She's bouncing between planets and the moon. She ends up in Paris for a little, uh, I don't know, rescue recovery, have a little drink. As uh, Zemo, while while this happened, he realizes Monica might be a little bit more powerful than he imagined. She was able to, I believe, fly through the moon or something. And then he and Moonstone are testing Blackout's powers. This ends up being very important. It turns out Blackout is far more powerful than any of us could have could have imagined. And it's also uh, he's noticing the descent among the team. So more more foundation laying for for further parts of the story. But I don't. I guess the the big thing is Monica's more powerful than imagined. So is Blackout, Joe. Yeah. Well, you have that. You have the struggle with um, you know Zemo and. Uh and Moonstone trying to uh, usurp control. control. And, and again, this has all been building up to, this doesn't just start here. Uh, same thing with uh, Hercules and uh, the Wasp uh, butting heads has been built up to for a while, and this is the payoff of that, uh, w- which we'll see develop in uh, the coming issues here. But, but yeah, it's... All, all this stuff with the Masters of Evil, they've been monitoring, they've been trying to get an idea of, you know, who's on the team, what's going on, how they work, so they could figure out the perfect moment to strike, and this is the issue where they find that moment. Absolutely. And we also see that the Black Knight and Wasp are going down the red carpet, Eric Brain. They're superstars. And we're getting questions from some reporters who are asking about Namor leaving the team. So you can see maybe the Avengers aren't at full strength. And the Masters of Evil are kind of plotting to take him down. And then it happens. They strike Avengers Mansion and they take Jarvis to open up the thing and really start bringing this thing to a boil, Breen. Great stuff. Yeah, they they, they set this up really well because they, they at the premiere, you know, Paladin shows up and Black Knight gets jealous because he's developed feelings for Jan, and yeah, so that, that that's a little bit, a little more discontent that they can you know, work into this. And when they finally do take over, yeah, they when when they go to take over the mansion, Hercules was supposed to be on monitor duty, but he had been he, he met a mysterious woman that he was out with that we find out was set up by Zemo. So mm-hmm. it's just Jarvis, and so obviously getting once they get in, he's, he's no reading a book. He is yeah. not prepared. Yeah, uh, not that it would have mattered, <laughs> but yeah. So I mean, it's you know, this way I set up. I said that you know the you, know, you find a way to deal with Captain Marvel because you know she truly is the most powerful member. Yeah. Hercules is the most powerful physical presence, but once you get once you deal with those two. You've got the Wasp and Black Knight because I said Namor's off on personal business, and they were pretty much you know down to that. So 
you know, great plan and so far executed to perfection. You can also, this, this issue proves, you can show that heroes have a nightlife, can go out to a red carpet or a gal or anything like that, and you can do it in a page and a half. Absolutely. You don't need well, a 12-issue event. You, you don't? <laughs> you, you, could, you could do it in like nine panels. We're in the wrong era. You know? It's, we uh, are in the wrong era. You know? <laughs> we are men out of time. <laughs> but but yeah, this is it, it's it's all just so good and, and rapid paced, and you really get to build up that both both teams are vulnerable. You you see the tension with Hercules and Wasp and some of the other stuff going on with the Avengers that that was also brought up, and you see right off the bat the butting heads between Zemo and and Moonstone. So it's setting up for the audience like. Anything can happen because both teams have these glaring flaws that can be exploited by the other. Absolutely. That takes us right into Avengers 274, Divided We Fall, a very apt title for this comic book, Joe. As Zemo and crew plot to take down the rest of the Avengers one by one, first we see the ambush of the Black Knight returning to Avengers Mansion. He does not see what's coming, and we see... uh, I think it's, uh, is it Yellow Jacket and Master Hyde lay the trap and kind of take him down? And then we have yeah. Captain Marvel kind of returns. She's, she needs to go back to Avengers Man- Mansion. She re- materializes in a room with Jarvis and the Black Knight and Blackout. We finally see him. He uses his powers to like encompass her in darkness and traps her in parts unknown. She literally just disappears. Yeah. Two it's... big pieces off the board. <laughs> the two biggest pieces. <laughs> off the board uh, in, in terms of power and physicality, but but yeah, and, and it's all very rapid paced. You you get uh, like what the second page you have, you know, Hyde punching through the wall to get to you, you know, Hyde punches Knight. a lot of stuff in this story. Yeah, there is a lot of destruction. <laughs> it it is just it's it's fantastic. You're, you're seeing them like. The stakes are really high, but, like, I think the thing that gets frustrating when you go back and read some of this stuff is you can have really high stakes like this, and it's not the universe or the multiverse (laughs) that's up for grabs. It's not the planet Earth. There's no alien invasion. It's not even, like, the island of Manhattan has been taken over. It's just the mansion. This is just against the Avengers, but the stakes are just as high, if not higher, for the reader than if, like, space and time or whatever was all at risk. This yeah, comes you down to the son can't. avenging the father. That's yeah. And yeah. It's, it grows into a story this big from that. Yeah. yeah. It's weird thinking, like, reading a story like this and being like, oh, a story where, like, Hide and just, just punch it through walls and they're ripping down the mansion and they're just beating people within an inch of their life. And it's like, this is quaint. <laughs> and it doesn't matter now because they've been completely rendered useless. But you don't realize how powerful Hyde is until you realize that members of the wrecking crew are wet themselves scared of him. <laughs> Yeah, he tells him, yeah. I will take all of you out simultaneously. Because the, like, the Wrecking Crew was bad <laughs> at one and, point. And, like, but you, you look at all the, these villains here, and these are, like, real threats. And, and, like, when you go back and read this, you, you like, miss a lot of these characters. Because I feel like you, you know, a lot of modern readers, if people came in within the last, like, 20 years, first off, you don't know half these villains because they don't use them, and when they do use them, they're in either big crowd scenes or they're just jokes. Mm -hmm. And and it's really weird. Like, You go back and you read this, and you're like, what what happened? How did we get from point A to point B? Because these are some really interesting villains doing interesting things, and, and they're either jokes or just removed from the board, and it's you know, same thing with half these adventures. Like, you could be a, a big fan of Marvel Comics the past couple of decades and have, like, 
not really any idea who like Black Knight or Paladin or some of these other characters are. Even Hercules, you you could have been reading. Kind of, he's showed up and stuff, but it would have been easy to like avoid. Oh yeah, he's in Maestro. Nope. Yeah, not exactly in the mainline series. You know, it's it's just it's it's weird how thinking about this and, and seeing where things went. Absolutely. So what we get next, Breen, is Captain America returns. Maybe not officially to the team, but he does return. And he tells Janet that he's a little bit concerned about the Avengers. He called the mansion. He talked to her, but it didn't feel like he was talking to her. And we see the Masters of Evil are wrecking Avengers Mansion as they're looking for things that are worth money. And Janet returns and finds Jarvis bound up. Jarvis lets her know to stop Hercules from walking into the trap. And we finally find out, Brain, that that beautiful woman that has gotten Hercules inebriated was paid off by Baron Zemo. She was a plant. She's helped lay the trap. And we get Cap and Wafts heading Hercules off. So things are kind of looking up. And they let him know, hey, listen, the Avengers are under attack. The mansion's been taken over. We need to regroup. It was a great moment. I was like, man, this is really, really flowing here. Brain. Yeah, I love this when he when he shows up at Jan's. When he says, the Avenger I talked to didn't seem to be interested in what I had to say. And she goes, I bet it was Hercules. All of a sudden he goes, no, it was you. <laughs> and that's when he realized, oh, something's wrong. So Absolutely. that's the first clue that something's you know, messed up. So they, yeah, they yeah. head off Hercules to the past. And that's when, you know, because he's, they like said, she's got him so doped and liquored up that he's, they say, I, she can't believe he can even stand to get out of the cab or the yeah. limo. And, that's when when Jan tries to explain the situation to him. That's when he breaks and said, "I've humored you long enough," and he, Mister hides his way out of the truck and just goes stomping off into the mansion. And, and that's that's so real because if you think about it, you you've got a god amongst mortals, and sometimes like I said if you're not, it, Hercules is always a little more headstrong than Thor anyway, so and a little more cavalier towards things. So it's completely believable that he would reach this point to where he's not going to listen to anybody because you notice not only does he not listen to Jan, he doesn't listen to Steve either. Yeah. He's going no. in. And and that's all, uh, again, like it, it, it part of just the, the quality of the writing, it's those little touches. Like, like I feel like a, a lesser writer would have taken a ch uh, an opportunity where, you know, Cap goes to visit the Wasp and wouldn't have added that little touch of hype that it was Hercules, you, you, you know, because that sets it up for, mm -hmm. you know, Janet the, them being really upset at the end of the issue when Hercules is laid out. And then... Yeah, because he, he goes in, and yeah. they have to follow him. They're like, yeah. screw on, man. you know, they can't, even though they're not happy with him, they have to follow him in there, Joe. Yeah. And these mechanical arms go out, and obviously the wasp shrinks down. She escapes, but they do grab Cap, and then we see, like, Blackout covers the entire Ventures man mount mansion with Cap, Black Knight, Monica Rambeau, and Hercules all trapped inside. Hercules has not been uh, captured yet, but he is essentially beaten to a pulp. And then it kind of they let him out, and Wasp finds him. But it's it's really crazy all the stuff that's going on yeah. here, and he is he is beaten almost to death. Shocking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it is. So, the, this whole thing is. But, but sorry, Brian. No, I was just say the, those those three pages where it starts with Hercules, you know, kicking Tiger Shark's can. And Tiger Shark is a formidable villain in his own right. He's gone toe to toe underwater with the Submariner. So he's, you know, not no cream puff. But then they said when, you know, when, when Hyde and the wrecking crew, then when, when Goliath grabs him and basically just anybody wondering where the idea for the Hulk and Loki from the first Avengers came from, it might've come from right here. Yeah. That, that or Bam Bam. It was great. When he was smashing his face into the ground. <laughs> and it's just cause you, you've never seen anything like this. And then, you know, and cap having to watch it. And then they basically, I'm guessing they let him out because they don't want his carcass stinking the place up because they think he's dead. Yeah. Because you know, that's how it ends. They can't find a heartbeat or a pulse. So that's, yeah. yeah and that's the, the warning at the end, I believe, is even a guy could die, which is the name of the next issue, Avengers 275. 275 we see um, 
the wasp is holding kind of vigil over Hercules in a you know hospital. Ant Man arrives to kind of help her out and and uh, see what's going on. At the same time, we've got Zemo gloating to Cap that he's beaten him and he's beaten the Avengers. He's really messing with him. He gives him a big villain monologue before he just slaps the hell out of Jarvis right in front of Cap. Really try to get him, and then we finally get to see Joe. Uh, Joe, we finally get to see Monica Rambeau is trapped in a swirling darkness and not even, she doesn't even know where the hell she is. She's just somewhere. They call it the dark dimension, I believe. Yeah, because um, they, they had encountered uh, him before, but he was never anything close to this powerful. So, you know, so she's, she's going through this. She's lost. Uh, but, but then, you know, this leads into uh, the, the introduction in this story, at least, well, right before this of the, uh, you know, we get Scott Lang as Ant Man, but mm-hmm. but again, it's using the like, like Roger Stern using the mythos, using what we know about the characters. Like she doesn't think it's Scott Lang at first. She you, you know she thinks it's Hank. So it, that kind of stuff it all adds to the story, and it, it's done in a way that you can keep the pace up with the story with these little bits adding so much to it yeah that's what builds up to the crescendo when you finally get to the end because everything's been it's it's building 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 he doesn't blow his wad in the first uh, issue or two he keeps you he keeps you around to the to the fifth issue which is great and so we get this pretty dramatic moment eric i wasn't expecting this the doctor tells janet hercules is dead he didn't make it she breaks down she starts crying she goes and visits the his body and she's kind of um, she blames him. She kind of blames herself, as you would imagine, somebody that's that's kind of grieving over the loss of of of, of a, at least a of partner as far as the Avengers. And then there's a bleep on the monitor, and they kind of figure out that he's his heartbeat is just really really slow, <laughs> is what has actually happened. And then boom, the absorbing man and Titania are coming for Hercules. The Wasp and Ant Man are there to protect him. It's just a really badass action scene that's going all through the place. You just get to see all the great powers. Ape Man and Wasp win. They even capture Titania in the end. But Hercules is still comatose, but his vitals are improving. That's what's going on, Eric. Now, something that you know, I didn't want to gloss over. When Zemo decides to dispatch the Absorbing Man and Titania to the hospital, presumably to make sure Hercules stays dead, and to take out the wasp, and you know, because she's there, that's to take you know, to take out another one. When when he's talking to Absorbing Man and Titania, they're mentioning they couldn't get their they couldn't reach the recruit that he wanted because of that blasted Spider Man, because it, they were in an issue of Spider Man going on at the same time as this. That's how tight continuity was under Shooter. Mm-hmm. And then, so I said, when they when they get to the hospital, the way they the way they do that scene, yeah, I now the, the way that they were able to defeat him, I said, basically the wasp defeats Crusher Creel, yeah, by using her wits, yeah, because uh, on paper, Ant Man the Wasp shouldn't last a panel against those two, but they separate him from his ability to absorb until they can, you know, they get him frazzled enough to turn human. And she even says, I went easy on you once because you're in your human form. I'm not going to make that mistake again. She drives him into the ground. I'd never seen anybody do that with that character before. I mean, I've seen plenty of interesting ways. There was one story where they literally trapped him in a cardboard box and essentially couldn't punch his way out of a paper bag. But this was (laughs) this was unique and this was really cool. And so, you know, now now the story is really getting somewhere because they're starting to knock off some of the masters team so even in the odds a little bit and you know the, the whole time this is going on black knight is trying to summon his sword but he can't get to it because the fixers got it the way mm-hmm. what he needs to do blocked and so i said there's so much going on but we're finally getting you know we're, we're finally getting close to a resolution because yeah. like i said there you know jan and and scott have you know made it through their battle and now they're in a position to go Try to find a way to help the rest of them. And that after that, Joe, they kind of revisit Zemo, who c- continues mocking Captain America. Yeah. Mister Hyde comes in and destroys kind of the old school Cap Shield. 
kind of yep. trying to send a message. And then this is crazy. Zebo orders Mr. Hyde to beat up Jarvis. Jarvis yep. isn't super powered. He's got no armor on or anything. Cap is looking on an abject horror and, and props to, to Busheba. He makes it look like Cap's about to wet himself as he's watching this just, you know, almost Hulk powered kind of villain just beating on a mortal man. Crazy stuff. Yeah, it's. Again, it, it's these stakes are fairly. The stakes are high, but like, again, what they're using isn't like the fate of, of millions of people. It's destroying an old shield. It's beating up one guy. Like, like you can you could really do amazing things here with this, and and you know, villains kidnapping uh, someone who couldn't defend themselves against them and, and beating them up to get a rise out of the hero. It's a thing that villains do. It's okay <laughs> <laughs> for for villains to just be, you know, irredeemable monsters in in this sense. Well, I think we find out at this point in the story that it really what this story is all about is Zemo wants to break Captain America to avenge his father. And when he has Hyde, and, and there's something even more despicable coming up than crushing his old shield, and there's that one panel where Cap just says, I'll remember this, Zemo. Oh, yeah. And that, and you notice the next time you see him, they put the gag back on Cap. But there, yeah, I said it's. It really is. When you when you break it all down, it's just one man trying to avenge his father for perceived wrongs done to him, and as he tries to break the unbreakable American spirit embodied in Captain America. Yeah, and uh, this is also probably important to point out that Mark Grunwald is the editor on this book, uh, and there is coordinating with that and what he's doing with Captain America, like that that's part of what's helping, uh, I think, uh, keep the focus on uh, Cap for this as well, and, and Cap's just done uh, beautifully here. I, I mean, I think two of the best people to ever take a crack at writing Captain America, uh, certainly, you know, from the 80s on would be you know, Roger Stern and Mark Grunwald. So having both of them involved in this story, I think is part of what helps make it great as well. Yeah. And then there's like somebody to do with this story was also working on fantastic four at the time. So they were able to, because remember they, that was mentioned a couple of times where they tried to contact yep. them because they need help, but they're you know, unavailable. And so, yeah, this is the, 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 the continuity at this time I said was just tight as a drum. And they are, they're about to make a call for help, and it's about to be answered, Brain, because we get into Avengers 276 Revenge. We've got the Ant-Man and Wasp talking to police. As Cap is seen, he's still bound in Assembly Hall within Avengers Mountain, which is still... Um, Avengers Mountain, I'm, I'm thinking about modern. Avengers Mansion, which is still encapsulated by that big dark, uh, black you know, darkness that's uh, taken over the mansion. We've got Ant-Man and Wasp coordinating with the military. they got like a makeshift base out in Central Park that are monitoring the situation. And then we get Wasp calling Thor for help. And then we see Captain Marvel still trapped in the dark dimension. And I guess she sees a flicker of light here, Joe. I'm not sure what's going on. She heads for it. And boom, she comes out as, as uh, we see Shroud in California and she comes out of his cloak. Yep. And I guess that was her exit point from this dark dimension. Yeah, like and, and we're building up here because uh, we got Dr. Druid shortly after this as well. Mm -hmm. But one of the interesting things about this part of the story is it's being crafted in a way where we'll never actually know if the Avengers as they were versus the Masters of Evil as they were, who would have really won because the Avengers end up getting a lot of help uh, from people who weren't in the core team that they were dealing with. Like from, you, you know, Dr. Druid, Trout, and, you know, Thor coming in and all that kind of stuff. So, Absolutely. It, the the Calvary's coming in. Yeah. The the numbers are, are about to get uh, up. 
And as uh, Joe just mentioned, Eric, we see Dr. Druid in New York. He's having premonitions that the Avengers themselves are in trouble. He concentrates and he sees that the Black Knight is bound and gagged. He realizes it's not just him that's in trouble. He changes in his hero uniform. At the same time, Captain Marvel and Thor arrive at the makeshift military outpost and the reinforcements have arrived. And they're going to go and retake Avengers Mountain. Or man, my mansion very soon, Breed. I can't get Mountain up my mind. Yeah, it's... And very it's heroic like, stuff. I loved it. It's like, oh, it's almost on. It's almost <laughs> on. And something else that goes a credit to his writing. You have Jan talking to the military. And they, they not only respect each other, the military agrees to acquiesce to her to give her a chance because said, you know, who's better equipped to handle super terrorists? You, you wouldn't get that now. It'd just be back and forth. It'd be back and forth bitch fest. Because you know, now it'd be, I'm not taking orders from no woman and, you know, blah, blah, you patriarchy. And back then I said, it's it just, it was a respect given, respect earned kind of thing, which allowed them to give them the shot to do something, you know, to, to, get back into the mansion yeah so it was very good i was I, this is one of like little hairs on the back of my neck are st- standing up I'm like oh it's it's about to happen at the same time we're seeing the masters of evil continuously ransacking avengers mountain and then pretty cool moment here joe yellow jacket realizes black knight sword is missing yes and then we see that he has freed himself to protect jarvis he's got his sword and he annihilates Hyde, or at least he starts to, which yep. is a great feeling when there's like six panels in a row of him punching him in the face. It might have felt like overkill to some people, but it wasn't enough for me. I wanted to see him continuously punching him in the face. And at that time, Cap starts to free himself. Thor, Ant-Man, Wasp, Dr. Ju- Jewett, Captain Marvel enter Avengers Mountain. And it's on with the with the Masters of Evil. It was great. This is oh, so worth it. Oh yeah, no, you're you're really getting all the payoff now. You're getting it there. They're, they're uh, you know, the pendulum swung in the other direction. Uh, they're uh, getting Jarvis. They're gonna they're gonna get him the help he needs. Uh, it, you know, Yellow Jackets uh, very much. You, you know, using thought bubbles, which I know is a tool for idiots, and uh, <laughs> you, you know, it immediately ruins a comic today. You can't put thought bubbles in it. But uh, this is how we find out that. You know, and we've been, this has been sprinkled through the story that Yellow Jacket kind of been like, I don't know, guys, like, is, you know, so we're we're waiting for Yellow Jacket to, to turn on, on the Masters <laughs> of Evil or to, or whatever Yellow Jacket's going to do at this point. It's, it, it, yeah, it, it's all really great. <laughs> so, something else you'll notice is that when, when Hyde was getting his butt kicked, if you look closely, some of those gloves are cap. Yeah. But they nice. don't, they don't, so both of them basically lay him out, but you don't see Cap right after that because he's already moved on. Yeah. But when, when Hyde runs into Thor and knocks himself out, which I thought was a great touch, because when you see all the, all the havoc he's wrecked throughout this story and running into a diminished Thor, because in Thor's own book, I think he'd lost the ability to heal or something like that. He was yes. really messed up because when Jan asked him, how, how is he? He goes, I am fine. And she said, I'd have a little easier time believing that if he wasn't gritting his teeth when he said that. Yeah. So, I mean, again, <laughs> that's, you know, and, you know when yeah. Thor shows up, there's a, there's an editor's note. This story takes place between pages five and seven in Thor 377 think about that oh. i mean that just how like i said it's just it, everything just fits perfectly in, in this era uh, and also Braden, i remember reading the first time when batman finally lays out guy gardner and feeling yep. very happy about the situation i felt more happy about this when i finally got to see hyde getting his face punched in it was the best knockout blow since guy gardner ate it from batman <laughs> yeah because well, because <laughs> nobody of all the of all the ma- bloated masters team, nobody deserved to get theirs more than Hyde and Goliath, and Hyde got his. So now we'll see if Goliath gets his. Yes. 
ends on a pretty interesting cliffhanger. We do see Zemo using Blackout, and he's he's basically threatening that he's going to send the Avengers and Avenger Mountain Mount Mansion to the Dark Dimension. <laughs> and that ends up uh, Avengers two seventy six. We get into two seventy seven. The price of victory. Shocking. It, it, the, the title does imply that they're going to win. And we've got the rest of the Avengers fighting whatever's left of the, the Masters of Evil. Specifically, we have Thor with a mat on to take on Goliath, Joe, which I absolutely loved. we got Cap uh, pursuing Wrecker, Dr. Druid discovering Blackout and Zemo. It appears that Dr. Druid may be out of the equation, but then he starts to take control of Blackout and start talking to him, you know, uh, you know subliminally, at least, Joe. Yeah, no, th- this is going on here, and then you have the uh, the fight with uh, Monica Rambeau and Moonstone, mm-hmm. where um, you, you know uh, Monica uh, accidentally uh, gets Moonstone to crash headfirst into a mountain, uh, not Avengers Mountain, mind you, just a mountain, <laughs> and uh, we're not sure. You know, maybe she broke her neck. That's 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 all going on now too, so so yeah, there there are multiple things happening, but it looks it's like pandemonium. Yeah, yeah, it's absolute pandemonium. But you know, it does the whole ending with uh, looking like you know Zemo still has that one trick left up his sleeve. Yeah, before then we got Yellow Jacket surrendering to Cap. We got the military going into raid Avengers Mansion. But Cap holds him off. He's like, you guys can't come in here. You're going to get sick. And we do get that uh, that moment where Captain Marvel arrives to keep Zemo in place. She's like, you're not going anywhere. You are going to get your, uh, your just due today. And we get a great... Ah, it, it's just... It's nice seeing something like this breed. Cap arrives. And we just get a nice one-on-one fight with Baron, von, uh, Baron Zemo. Uh, obviously, Zemo is not equipped to take out Captain America one-on-one. He does eat what he deserves. And we, we do get to see a bit of a fallout. And, oh, this is pretty sad, though, Brain. You know, once once he's won, Cap finds the last picture that he has of his mother, and it's ripped in half. And he's yeah. in tears. And, you know, the, the price of everything that's happened. It, like Joe said, it, it does. it's not a galactic scale, level scale event. You know, the world isn't about to die. But, you know, Cap has, has lost the last memento that he had of his mom. No, but before he did, before on the way to getting there, while Thor's fighting Goliath, Cap has to take on the Wrecker by himself. Now, in the issue before, when Thor had stripped the Wrecking Crew of their godly powers, it had all gone back into the Wrecker. So the Wrecker had become you know, powered up. By this time, he's more of a high level threat, and Cap takes him on one, you know, one on one, finds a way to beat him. Because I said, you know, Wrecker was instrumental in, like I said, tearing up the mansion and what few personal belongings Steve had. So yeah, when they when they get to the, you know, after after you know, Cap defeats Zemo, that which, like I said, was you know inevitable, you know, and absolutely ended just how you would expect. Then Cap can finally, after being so stoic through all of this. He finally lets himself break down because, basically, his you know his all of his personal belongings, his life, has been you know torn up, and You're he finally gives locker. himself a moment yeah. to yeah to be a hero. And then this, the last two pages with um, Steve and Monica are again just another example of how well this story was written and just how great a handle Stern had on these characters, and that's what people. People have forgotten largely how great this era was, but I've said even though none of his stories made my top ten, nobody did characterization better than Roger Stern because he took characters that otherwise, Doctor Drew or anyone you wouldn't care about and made you care about them. I think he's he probably did the best rendition of Namor we've ever gotten. I would say absolutely the best Hercules, and you know. And his version of Cap is right up there with Grunwald. So is this just a, this is just a great story. Yeah, it's crazy what he was able to do with that picture, Joe. You get this wonderful character moment. And that's why that's what I fall for, right? Yeah. I get I want a big fight and everything, but I want a character moment. You know, mm-hmm. something that really 
tells me something about the character. Now, that moment tells you everything about Captain America, who he is, a man out of time. His entire family is gone. He yeah. has nothing left of him. He had a picture, and even that's gone now. Yeah. No, I, I mean, that uh, losing his home, because uh, he had j- the Avengers, Man- Avengers Mansion had been his home for a while. He had left. He had really, at this point in, in Grunwald's run, Uh, He had just moved out of his old apartment and was moving back into the Avengers Mansion because he was going to be traveling around uh, the country and just wanted a place that he could stay in in New York while he was going around. So so he had, like, just settled back into what he basically considered his old home and has been completely destroyed. Throughout this issue, we see, uh, you know, just the rest of it just getting completely demolished. So... Uh, you get to see all that. You see, uh, you, you know, the loss of, of blackout, and you feel bad for him at the end because he's just being—he's being manipulated abused. and abused by everyone, and he—he he ends up uh, dying in the end. You—you uh, you see, sort of that tragic moment with, with Moonstone. That uh, yes, it does appear that you know she's broken her neck, and it's going to be a while before she'll be okay. And uh, you do get a bit of payoff from that. In, uh, was it Dwayne McDuffie and I think it was Mark Bright did a one shot uh, Captain Marvel with Monica Rambeau like two years after this I want to say uh, that uh, has Moonstone coming back and she's not happy she's like just sort of more or less healed and uh, it's it's not good so so yeah that that's also part of the, the wonderful continuity and and things being set up and paid off. And it's a different, a it's a different stuff. Marvel, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is no, when everything does different. matter. Not everything's the biggest thing in the world, but everything that's happening matters. Yeah, it's easier to make things matter when they're more understandable stakes like that. Uh, I- instead of it always being the world or multiple worlds and everything being at stake. This is uh, fantastic stuff, Breed. This is definitely an era I need to go revisit. Obviously, you know, I was I hadn't even I wasn't even thinking about just the kind of era we're not in, only in for Marvel, but DC at the same time. You're, you're talking about a wonderful time to be a comic book fan, but yeah, Roger Stern's uh, Avengers run, right? just right here as, as an example. If you just distill it down, you're talking about ultimate character moments. You know great action all paid off and it builds up to that crescendo i love that's what i love about a lot of these stories in modern comics a lot of it you you get the big bang at the beginning and it never lives up to the to the beginning of the story and yeah. here the beginning of the story is great it can't live up to the end yeah. well a couple of things that i about this story if this story were being done today you can guarantee that hercules would have shown up to take part in the final battle but that would have ruined this story because that was the whole idea was how badly he was hurt. Now, th- this story had repercussions that were felt for literally more than a decade because four of the members of these Masters of Evil went on to form the core of the Thunderbolts. You know, Zemo, Goliath, Moonstone, and the Fixer. Now... About 20 issues into the Thunderbolts, Hawkeye becomes the team leader. And that is about the time where Hercules decides to pay Goliath back for beating him near to death. And he basically goes, and who's Atlas by this time? And Atlas has legitimately reformed. So he is a hero now and feels terrible about what he'd done. But Hercules has come to get him some. And Hawkeye is able to stop him. And he goes, out of respect for our past association, I'll back off. But our friendship is done. And so I said, that those are the kind of things. You look at that versus now when Carol Danvers can kill Tony Stark and six months later be lecturing him about something else. So I said, it's it was a different era. Don't mean to keep banging on the new stuff in relation to this. But this is why when I say read back issues this is what i'm talking about yeah and um you know i also uh should have mentioned too this is all happening during uh mutant massacre and (laughs) x-men 
It's Unspoiled. just too much. The spoils. It, it's the booty. It, it, oh my it, goodness! You know, it's just <laughs> like, like what? The? <laughs> That's all very good. So, Joe, I certainly this stuff's great. <laughs> where can we find this story? Is it in a trade? I imagine it's in an omnibus. Where, where can people get some? You know, it's here? not in an omnibus yet, but yeah, I have the same <laughs> epic collection here. Uh, Roger Stern's Avengers isn't collected in an omnibus yet. It's very weird. Uh, they put out like Bob Harris's run, uh, or you know, they put out the Gathering omnibus before they put out any of Roger Stern's stuff. It's very. It's very strange. Very odd choice, but you know, I, I mean, Avengers: the, the Crossing has an omnibus, and none of Roger Stern's stuff is out yet. It's very weird, but uh, m- maybe one day, because uh, it's there's a lot of baffling things. Because that's not an omnibus. None of Grunwald's cap is in an omnibus format. It's just who the hell knows. But <laughs> so is that the only? People can find it unless they go and get the back issues. Is that epic collection? This is the one that's in print. Uh, there are older trades. Like this was collected multiple times. Uh, mm-hmm. If you can't like the, the epic collection, I think is still uh, in print and accessible. But there are older trades. If you go to if you go to a shop, uh, a lot of times, like you know, you should be able to get something. Look online uh, if you don't have a, a local shop, but. Yeah, you know, and, and the back issues for this aren't going to break the bank. Yeah, so. I was going to say, this is one of the few stories we've done where you can find the actual issues cheaper than you could buy the collection that they're yeah. a part of. It might be the Good. only one we've done, honestly. Definitely, yeah. if you have a chance, go out and have some fun. See if you can hunt these down and get get a, get a set of the originals. It'd be more fun that yeah. way anyway. See that yeah. original stuff from Bashem and, and Tom Palmer because we didn't harp on it enough here just because the writing mm-hmm. from Stern was so strong. But the art in here is incredible. Some of the action is just mind blowing, especially when you get that that Goliath Thor fight was like that's the good stuff. Oh yeah, and um, and I feel very similarly with like someone like Tom Palmer. I especially today, I feel like inkers like. You know, obviously, Klaus Janssen and you know Terry Austin and people like that kind of overshadow some of the uh, some really solid anchors like Tom Palmer, who, who's contributed a lot to to Marvel over the years. Absolutely. So this is a ball. I hope you guys have already read it. If you haven't, definitely go out and find it. Read it for yourself. Experience this. You're gonna want to. Next week we'll be talking about DC Comics. We'll be going that way back machine. Thank you very much to my good friend Joe Corallo. Thank you very much to my good friend Eric Breed. And we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye.